Hello and welcome to Reptiles and Research. So we're going to get some foundational knowledge in you on California king snake care. Now the knowledge that I have comes from keeping my own as well as working with them in stores and I've bred my Mexican black king snakes which depending on who you ask in terms of which taxonomist you ask it is a California king snake or it isn't then it is again then it isn't. So you could argue I have three California king snakes or you could argue I have a California king snake and two Mexican black king snakes. Either way this care information is going to help you. The minimum size tank you're going to want is the length of the snake. So if you've got a four foot snake you're going to want a tank with the internal dimensions of four feet. This allows their spines to stretch out and them to actually stretch their vertebra. I can tell you now this California king snake in here stretches out across the front so regularly that I was doing a 30 day challenge once to see how many days I can catch him out stretched out in a row. They really like to do this so let's make sure that your enclosure can accommodate this. Now being able to stretch out isn't like a huge stretch by the imagination. In the wild they traverse multiple times their own lengths between different den sites and foraging and hunting. They're moving and stretching far more in the wild. I don't really think this is that unreasonable as a bare minimum to be able to stretch your spine out. Your California king snake might end up more than four feet and might end up less than four feet. So my advice would be shoot for a four by two by two and if it's less than that great you've given it more space. If it's four feet great. If it's just over like a couple of inches you could argue that you'll be okay or if you want to be absolute with that minimum give it a five foot and then you've given it extra space as well. Just make sure that your snake in general has the ability and the agency of their own spine and the ability to stretch out. Again, these are minimums. Don't let yourself as a keeper be defined by minimums. I myself only have a three foot California male king snake and he is going into a seven foot vivarium when it arrives. So the world is your oyster. It's not going to get lost in there. They're far more in the wild. It's just as a minimum they should be able to stretch their spine out. You can buy a 4x2x2 for as little as $299. Custom Rental Habitats has a brand new series, a new line of enclosures with this fantastic little spot to put your heating and lighting in. And I think that is a great new way to make things easier for new keepers. So if you want to check those out, look at a link in the description or the pinned comment and go get yourself a brand new Vivarium. If you've got a tiny little hatchling and you're raising it up, it can go in like an exoterra and that sliding vent that, that meant to slide across and cover those vent holes for the wires. You can either silicone that shut or put a bit of blue tack behind it or I don't know what you Americans call it. It's like um, sticky tap. I, I don't know. Um, but just make sure that they can't slide that across and get out of those wire holes and if you have that fully across and they can't get out an exoterra is basically escape proof. The only escape they then have is when you open the doors. But again, if you're opening the doors, you are there, so you're in control of the situation. You can use the little fornariums like I have for my hatchling Mexican black king snakes when I bred them. You can get that and raise them up to a certain size and then upgrade to that adult enclosure. Now, before I go into all the heating and lighting for care for king snakes, I want to address the old school way of thinking with like the king snakes are scared of light and they're like light phobic when they're absolutely not and actually we, we, we break this down in a really logical and biological manner it's actually quite illogical so let's break this down so melatonin is the hormone in us that makes us sleepy at night because we're diurnal animals but on the flip side if an animal is nocturnal melatonin gives them energy so we both use the same hormone but it does the opposite for both of us so when light hits our eyes as diurnal mammals, it blocks the melatonin production and that blocking of that makes us wake up. But in the reverse, the light hitting the, the eyes of a nocturnal animal stops them creating melatonin. And because the melatonin for a nocturnal animal gives them activity, gives them energy and makes them go to sleep during the light time. So we use light and this cycle of stopping off melatonin production in the exact same way we're just following the reverse scripts they're getting energy from melatonin we're getting sleepy from melatonin my point being is light is still their cue to when to even be nocturnal and when to even sleep light's the cue to make them act appropriately as per their biology so once you know that 
The notion that nocturnal animals should sit in perpetual darkness is actually quite an illogical premise. If there's no light upon them and they're not experiencing light, then there's nothing to trigger and stop the production of melatonin to make them sleep and act in a nocturnal fashion. They're simply just sat in the dark. And hormonally, what are those animals going to look like compared to those that have a set day and night schedule and a really healthy pattern? This notion of keeping them in perpetual darkness just because they're nocturnal is no different from looking at us being diurnal animals and then being like, oh, so therefore we have to have lights on 24-7. Could you imagine if we never got darkness to sleep? That's effectively what's happening to nocturnal species when, never, when we're never giving them light to sleep. When you think about it in that way, it's so ridiculous that that's even what we're doing, but that's an old school way of thinking and we need to move past that now. So I just want to address that so we can have that foundation there and we can move on from it because you're going to hear loads of old school stuff about king snakes and we really want to move forward from that. It's 2023. <laughs> so regardless of what it is, crepuscular, nocturnal, diurnal, just provide them with a day and night cycle. All you have to do is give them a day and night and no matter what it is you're keeping, they will act accordingly as per their biology. You don't have to do any sort of like fine tuning as to what you think it should do. Just give it its day and night cycle and the animal will do what it's supposed to do. As a general rule, you want to put your lights on for 12 hours a day. Um, but realistically, during the year, you want to sort of like change how long the lights are on for to match your seasonal day length wherever you're living so that it's not out of balance from like the light coming through the windows and stuff. But yeah, you just want to come on in the morning and go off at night, essentially. And what the length of time that is, is kind of variable in what you're trying to achieve. For the most part, the general rule is 12 and 12. So California king snakes like it quite cool. I recommend you allow the cool end of your enclosure to go all the way down to 20 degrees or 68 Fahrenheit. And then on the warm end of the enclosure, give them a basking surface temperature of 27 degrees Celsius or that's 80 Fahrenheit. You can go up to 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. If it's just in that ballpark, that's a nice little warmer spot for them. We don't have to be that anal about it. Just in that ballpark, you're good to go. In the wild, they have rocks, branches, crevices, holes, lots of things to hide in. They can be in a nice burrow that's insulative and like kind of warm, or they can be under a bit of board that's been warmed by the sun and they're getting that thigmotaxis warming via touch. Not necessarily belly heat, but it might be back heat in that instance. But they also have the option to sit in the sun and warm up through that method. What I recommend is provide a heat lamp in your enclosure, normally an incandescent or a halogen bulb. These basically have the same rays as the sun or shortwave infrared. Basically what that means is you have that coming down onto a nice little basking spot. You can have a rock beneath it and lots of clutter around it. So it can be on the rock warming under something that's been warmed by the lamp. And then you have that choice like they do in the wild of being under something, partially out under the sun or fully out under the sun. And they just give them the choice to do that. That way you allow them the choice of both and greatly increase the behaviours that they are motivated to perform in their home in your house. Just make sure that the enclosure doesn't get too warm. You really want them to have those cool spots. They appreciate the cool spot just as much as they appreciate the warm spot. Again, the bigger the enclosure, the further away from the heat the king snake can get. So let's say I've got my heat lamp right here. Then my Kelly king could be all the way over there at a very low temperature, just chilling. And if it wants to warm up, it can go there. But the bigger the tank, the wider the gradient and the easier this gets. At night time, turn all the heat and lighting off. Let them have that nighttime drop in temperatures and that darkness for night time. That's really good for their immune system, which is great for their health and great for your wallet because you're not wasting electricity at night time. So let's talk about UV. So California king snakes can survive without UV and they've been bred for many generations without it. I mean, we can't argue that the amount of king snakes that haven't even had a lick of UV that have been bred successfully over and over and over again. However, UVB is very good for California king snakes. Studies in related species like corn snakes have shown their vitamin D levels have risen, which is greatly good for their health under UV. So reptiles make vitamin D in their skin under UV, and they have a natural, like, optimal cutoff point that they won't overdose themselves by overproduction. So if they get too much, they stop. So you can argue that this up level up here is the optimal zone 
So then, why then in these corn snake studies did their vitamin D levels rise by 211%? You could argue if they're already at optimal levels, because the classic knowledge we have in the hobby is that they get all they need from vitamin D in their food. So why then do they not just like top up or just slightly change or not change at all? But a 200% increase, it isn't possible that they're near the optimal line already. So that means that these snakes were literally low on vitamin D, which shatters what we previously thought. Yes, a California king snake isn't a corn snake, and we haven't actually studied California king snake specifically, but they also had the same result come back in a Burmese python, and I think a California king snake is more related to a corn snake than a Burmese python, so if both the colubrid example and the constrictor example, the bow example, both do it, it's very likely that a closely related California king snake does so just like the corn snake. If they can hybridize and produce vi viable fertile offspring and are that closely related to do that, they're probably closely related enough that it has the same effect on vitamin D for the California king snake. Again, you cannot say it for certain because the actual individual study hasn't been done yet, but I would argue it's very, very likely and very, very probable. So I would argue, why wouldn't we? Like, you give your California king snake UVB, you just plug in that light bulb. And it's like, great, let's say in five years time, a study comes out and says, actually, nothing happened. It didn't change their vitamin D levels at all. You'd be like, oh, OK, well, I did that and I didn't need to. Cool. Whereas the reverse, it's like if it comes out and says, yeah, they, it does this and they need it. You'd be like, oh, like I've been neglecting to give them this thing that they probably should have all this time. I feel bad. Whereas if you just give it to them, you're like, eh, I was doing that the entire time. So. I would recommend always giving your snakes UVB. As a personal rule, I won't keep a snake without UV. I literally just won't. Um, this California King snake in this bioactive has two LEDs, a heat lamp, and a UV. So I'm very much for giving them the lighting. So you want your UVB to be one third across the heat side, so that it's clustered with your heat lamp. So you have this little sunny patch of sun and this dark side of shade and cool. So one third to a half, and then the other half can be just shaded and cool. You don't want it to be all the way across like the old school method. That's when we had much weaker bulbs and we made sure that we, they couldn't leave it because they needed this constant exposure. Nowadays, we go for the sun trap method of having like one patch of sunlight and then shade. Like I say, I provide mine with LEDs. So it's very important that your king snake has a photo period, a day night cycle, just like I said earlier. So if you're going by this guide, you have your halogen and UV and that is great. That's either side of the spectrum of sunlight. You've got UV and then you've got infrared, but in the middle is the visible light spectrum. And that's what we see with our human eyes. So basically full spectrum LED lighting fills in that section and we've got completely represented the entirety of sunlight. Again, this one is optional, but I think it's very good to do it. So if you're gonna go all out and be like the best California king snake keeper you can be, highly recommend you do it. They also link up to the UV, so they both run off the one plug to the wall. They're great. I mean, they're in like eight watts. So let's talk about substrate. So substrate allows them to dig and express those behaviors that are really motivated to perform. It allows them to dig down to cool spots or even warm spots. It allows them to access humid microclimates under things or in things or down at the bottom of the substrate. It's very, very useful for your California king snake. Now you can go for shavings in the dry method and then actually give them a humid microclimate in terms of a hide box stuffed with wet moss. That gives them the humid microclimate, you can do that. Or you can go soils and things like that and do a very natural type of substrate but have humidity at the bottom of it so they can dig down to it. And both of these options give your California king snake what they need out of substrate. Just make sure that it's several inches deep for digging and you, you'll be golden. So let's talk about decoration. So what I recommend is lots of decorations in there, lots of clutter. I like to create a visual barrier across the entire back wall. Give them a little corridor to move, which means that they can't be seen, but I can access the entire thermal gradient. It's really important that they don't have to be forced to choose between feeling secure and the actual temperature they want. It's an old school way of doing it is a hide on either end, and it's not that great. I'm forced to do it with my ball python at the moment, and I'm hating it, but I will fix that when she's in a seven foot. But you don't want them to be forced between two options because then they won't actually be able to do what they want to do. Lots of logs, branches, things that they can get on, under, in front of, behind, 
make sure they can climb at least a little bit just to be able to get their body off the floor. Again, I've got like these fancy fake rock wall ledges, but it doesn't have to be that advanced. It can just be a few like sticks and logs that are, like jut out off the floor and down again just to get them to climb. It's incredibly good for their exercise and their body. In the wild, they might climb cactuses and raid a bird's nest and come down again, might climb 10 feet in the air. So I'm not saying you need to go hardcore and give them 10 feet, but just the ability to just lift their body off the floor would be greatly appreciated by them. So let's talk water and humidity. So you want to give them water in the form of a water bowl and you want this bowl to be big enough for them to soak in. And then, like I said before, give them a humid hide packed with some moss, just to allow them to have that humid hide when they want to shed. It is very, very vital and important to have that. Yes, they might shed perfectly fine without it, but it's also very valued by them. So for the price of what it actually costs to supply that, just give them the humid hide. Let's talk about diet. So the California King Snake is an opportunistic generalist. I covered back in the day a very detailed video talking about what they found in museum specimen stomachs and they did a whole breakdown of what they're eating in the wild. It's very very interesting but interestingly they're eating as much mammals they were snake. It was 27% mammal and 27% snake I think from memory. So that, again, they aren't like truly, truly snake eaters. They're, it's much more varied. They're eating a lot more. Basically, consider them, they'll, if, if they can grab it, they'll eat it. That's the motto with the king snakes. And I think that's fairly fair and represented by the study. So when you're feeding your babies, in terms of what we have access to, you're probably going to feed like pinkies. I would do that once every five days until they grow large enough where... The items that we have available to us can be offered in variety. So a pinky is far smaller than a, like a, like a, ch a quail chick. But once you get your king snake up to a certain size, then it can have the variety. And then as they get up to adult size, they can have a full varied diet. Quails, quail chicks, multi-mammoths, rats, mice, hamsters, gerbils, quail eggs, reptile eggs. If you have access to it, it can probably eat it. The size of your snake at the widest part and then maybe equal to that of the prey or slightly more they'll be able to swallow that fine to be fair they can swallow far bigger than that but as a general rule that's what you want to go for do that every five days as a baby and then as it gets larger you can switch to every 10 days as an adult schedule and scale that up to the point where they're eating like an, the size of an xl mouse every 10 days if you notice that your king snake's getting fat you can take that to every 14 days if you notice your king snake's constantly hungry and coming forward and like wanting food, you can take it down to seven days and hold it there. And then if it starts gaining weight, you take it back to 10 days and then see if that weight drops off. Basically, if you pivot from 10 as baseline, it's really hungry, seven. Oh, it's, it's getting fat, 14. Just that little needle, move that back and forth. And then you can basically like individualize your feeding routine to your individual snake's metabolism there is one caveat to that and that's when you're breeding and then the female can eat like the xl mouse like every five days because she's going through like ovulation making the follicles and making eggs and getting ready but other than that for the most part i stick to that routine feeding is pretty fluid it doesn't actually have to be this rigorous and this like defined for you but i know as beginners you want like something concrete to latch on to before you find your feet then figure out what you want to do for yourself I'm much more fluid. It doesn't have to be that size of item. You could feed m multiple smaller items if you wanted to. But for the sake of this video, that's the guide I'm going to give you. Stick to that. Get your footing. Get a feel for it. And then you can start playing with the other options you can do. So let's talk about brumation. So these snakes naturally will hibernate in the wild. They'll go underground where it's insulated and not as harsh as the surface temperatures and they'll hunker down, stay there, go semi-dormant and stay there until spring. Now some people don't brumate the California king snakes and keep them the same temperature in captivity all year round to feed them all year round and they do just fine. Some people even breed them by doing that and don't feel the need to brumate. It's more to do with like the male sperm not being overheated during this time and the sperm killed. But there's also some evidence to the suggest that the possibility is there that brumation might extend their lifespan. So in a study on rat snakes, it showed that being able to brumate and get down to low enough temperatures extended their lifespan by up to a third. So the possibility is there that it might be applicable to king snakes. So for the sake of that, I do recommend brumating. So what I do is I get to mid-October, say like October 15th, and then I stop feeding. And then I give them to the end of October, and this entire 15-day 
two week window they don't eat at all and we're waiting for them to defecate and digest and get this out of their system once we get to the end of that on november 1st we then bring the day length down to from 12 hours to eight hours and then we'll bring the temperatures down to 25 on the basking spot and let the coolant go as cool as possible by mid-november i then take the day length down to five hours and then turn the heat off completely and just leave them with their UV and their Jungle Dawns or their LEDs and just turn the heat off. And then on December 1st, what I do is I remove them from their enclosures, place them into a hibernation box, a basically a rub tub or a tote, give them substrate, a hide, a water bowl, and you want to place it somewhere cool that they can get down to brumation temperatures. For some people, this might be a garage. It might be a basement on the concrete floor that like, is a, like a heat sink and stays quite cool. It might be in the attic or it might be in a refrigerator for some people. But you want them to go down to around 10 degrees Celsius, which is, I believe, 50 Fahrenheit. Again, make sure you actually monitor them and make sure they're doing okay. If they suddenly start to like lose weight during brumation, then you can start to bring them up. But for the most part, they should be absolutely fine. And then coming to spring, we do the reverse. So we take them out of this place that's cool and leave them in the tubs, place them in like a room, like your bedroom, living room, somewhere where it's just room temperature, allow them to slowly raise their temperature up to room temperature over the course of a couple of days. Then I place them back in their enclosure and then I start increasing day length again. And basically do the reverse of what we did going in, increase day length, temperature up, all the way up, back up to like the 12 hours and the full temperatures. Some people just blast and just turn the heat straight on at full temperatures. I like to be more gentle, but both methods do seem to work. So pick and choose what you want to do there. But for the most part, that's how I would hibernate them slash brumate them. In terms of handling, what I do is choice based handling. So if my king snake doesn't want to be touched, I don't touch. There is a way to do this that can be really cool. They can come out onto your hand to consent to being handled when you get to that sort of level. I also do lots of training to get them to move to where I want them to go rather than forcibly move them, but that's like an upper level. And for now, this foundational knowledge just to get you to look after your California King Snake to a good beginner standard and to a good welfare standard, this guide is the guide for you. If you want all that advanced stuff, I have other videos on the channel and I'm gonna make much, much more. So if you're into this, subscribe and I'll see you in another video.